people ask me, what is the difference between your business in the early days and now? And I say the noughts on the end, because that's the only difference. It's exactly the same thing. London's Mayfair, the home of money and style. Also the appropriate setting for international diamond dealer Lawrence Graf, as he reveals his latest collection of diamonds to the press. I'm in a truly exciting business. Diamonds are one of the greatest treasures known to man. Graf knows the world of gems better than most, but one exceptional diamond presented him with probably one of his greatest challenges. I knew it was going to cost a lot of money. And I didn't really know what we were going to get out of it. In November 2006, Graf decided to buy one of the world's largest uncut diamonds. The price was $12 million and a chance to turn it into one of the rarest collections in the world. Assuming, of course, all went well. No one can be really sure what's going to come out of a rough diamond. Lawrence Graf is one of the top names in the world of select jewellery. For half a century, he's made exclusive pieces for the wealthy, for kings and queens, and heads of state. According to the latest rich list, he's worth an estimated 1.3 billion pounds. But however successful he's been, he's always tried to keep the customers happy and thinks nothing of flying halfway across the world in his private jet to show someone his latest collection. For Graf, diamonds are a way of life, a consuming passion. You always know where you are, he says, with a diamond. In this program, we see how the king of diamonds found the ultimate gem. For centuries, diamonds have been a unique status symbol. The hardest substance in the universe, diamonds make every woman elegant and glamorous. Whether it's a high street engagement ring or the sumptuous British crown jewels, diamonds have that undeniable allure. An allure which Lawrence Graf has made his mission in life as he travels the world buying and selling exclusive gems. It's been said that more of the world's top diamonds have passed through Graf's hands than that of any other dealer. We've cut stones and they've become history because they've been the largest of their time. Even the largest emerald cut diamond in the world or the largest oval cut diamond in the world, the largest heart shaped diamond in the world, the largest brilliant diamond in the world, we've made them all. Lawrence uh, became famous from his, you know, a few high net worth individuals, Sultan of Brunei and others. He has had a great ability to market these uh, special stones to some of the wealthiest individuals in the world. Since diamonds were first discovered, they were always held in the highest esteem. But really the appeal of diamonds isn't from now, it's from centuries old. The natural beauty of a diamond and the fact that they're found in nature and created over billions of years, that adds to their allure, especially in the modern day. Diamonds always come to the fore at any glamorous occasion. You'll see all the actresses and uh, have been adorned with uh, pieces of diamond jewelry, and they've always made someone feel special. Uh, women love wearing diamonds, and they always have loved wearing diamonds. How else can one express one's love? You give her a gift. What gift do you give? Well, you give her a gift that you can afford. Whether it's a one carat or a hundred carat stone, the expression is the same. Put a little sparkle in your heart. And they make me feel fantastic. It's, it's just that kind of special feeling, isn't it? The bigger, the better. They're a symbol of love. I mean, mine for my husband um, represents everything to me. I don't know what it does to other people, but to me, they don't even have to be the most expensive diamonds that you can get. Just the fact that you know that they're diamonds and they're special. Hollywood has always had a love of diamonds. Stars such as Elizabeth Taylor are renowned for their passion for jewellery passion that the late actor Richard Burton addressed 
when he gave her gems worth millions of dollars. It accentuated their love and uh, it was noticed by the public and the power that Richard must have felt when he gave her a 60 carat diamond that she put on, the most beautiful woman in the world. She was not only his, but he endorsed it by giving her another wonderful creation that she could have close to her. But square cut or pear shape, these rocks don't lose their shape. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. They are a girl's best friend because when a, when a man, especially in the modern world, gives a gift of a diamond to a lady, it becomes hers. It really is hers. Diamonds for men is, is now becoming a very powerful force. And in the new markets, driven by celebrities, David Beckham, his work Diamond Studs, and, and, uh, and many other people, um, Diamonds for Men is certainly is, uh, is one of the new trends. It's like an adrenaline rush to open maybe a blue Tiffany box and pull out, I don't know, a ring that has this ginormous diamond just sparkling in your eyes. It's just amazing. Any great collector, whether it's a collector of art or a collector of stones, buys them because he truly loves them and he wants them in his collection. And I think history has proved that if you buy the best of anything, it's going to be a good investment. And incidentally, to buy the best, it's always the highest price. Ralph started his career in the traditional home of diamonds. Here's a street which, if it isn't actually paved with gold, is still the richest highway in the world, Hatton Garden. Home of precious stones. I started in a very humble way. I started sitting at the bench, learning to be a jeweler, using my hands, making jewelry. And I had a lot of confidence. I always felt that I was born to be amongst these stones. I was born to be in the diamond business. I just felt it so natural. The first diamond ring I sold was 100 pounds. And when I sold that ring for 100 pounds, it was a huge jump from selling the semi-precious stones for five pounds. So I soon learned that why sell and buy for five or six pounds when I can buy and sell for 100 pounds. And it wasn't long before I made a second one for 200 pounds, then 500 pounds, then 1,000 pounds first time I came across rather than met Mr. Lorenz Grafos when we were bidding on the same building in the early 60s. The Diamond Fraternity is a very, very sort of small world and was even smaller some time back when everybody knew everybody and before computers and before the jet aeroplanes uh, when uh, the word of the person was uh, his bond. The diamond industry has always been based on one's word. And it's one of the traditions across cultures that when a deal is done between diamonds, one ends it with a handshake. And there, are no, there have been no written contracts in, in the diamond industry that like everything, it's changing to some extent, but the fundamentals of most of the trading of the polished diamonds is still done on a handshake, and it's ended with the word Mazal. Graf, an ambitious and determined salesman, saw the potential of an untapped international market. Now, one rainy day, I stopped off at um, an agency, and I said, I'd like a ticket. And the agent says, where would you like a ticket to? I said, just anywhere with the sun shining. <laughs> He says, well, this time of the year, why not Australia? Ralph was on his way to Australia with samples in his bag. But en route, he stopped at the bustling trading city of Singapore, something that would have an effect on his future. I stopped off in Singapore. I looked around, and I had my little box of samples. I saw a store called Robinson's Department Store, like a miniature Harrods. I wandered in, and standing behind an empty counter was a gentleman that knew me from the north of England. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm on my travels around the world with my sample case. He said, well, we could, you, we could use some good jewellery here. Went back to London, worked like crazy to get some jewellery together, went back to Singapore, 
And that was my first public showing in the Far East, which was successful. From then onwards, I went back every two months. So from the 100, 200, 500,000 pound in England, I jumped to 10 and 20,000 pound, which was a sizable sum of money. And I was a novelty. It was a young man from London, a jeweler, and I did have some lovely things, not many of them, but they were lovely. I created them in the most beautiful way, using quality right from the beginning. In fact, I traveled the world. I went to Africa, and that's when I started meeting people in the diamond business. I was there actually to sell jewelry, and I made a mental note that that's where the diamonds come from, and I've got to get involved. I did get involved in Africa, and I was fortunate enough to um, buy into a diamond cutting factory, which was a very small business, which I've, um, I've helped uh, with the expertise that we have in that business to make that business into the largest diamond company in South Africa today. always had a special feeling for Africa and was to find some of his finest diamonds here. Letseng is the world's highest operating mine, perched 10,000 feet up in the mountains of the landlocked kingdom of Lesotho. Some of the biggest rough diamonds have been discovered in the two and a half million tons of rock excavated each year. Diamonds are unlike almost any other stones in that they don't form at the Earth's surface, but much deeper underground, from carbon under intense heat and pressure in the layer of volcanic magma called the mantle. The diamonds that reach the surface arrive by chance. A massive underground explosion, a bit like an underground volcano, pushes the precious stones up to the surface. For a century, millions of tons of rock have been carved out of the mine. Somewhere in the collections of rocks which are broken down and sorted could be that extra special jewel. But it doesn't happen often. Over five decades, only three diamonds over 500 carats have been found. In the sorting house, the rocks are graded into smaller and smaller sizes. X-rays are used but the key to finding precious stones also depends on a sorting process done by hand, where the human eye can spot a glint, a gleam, that means a diamond. In October 2006, a female worker spotted one day what was to be the 15th largest uncut diamond in the world, the kind of gem that Lawrence Graff would find irresistible. It was to become the Lesotho Promise. It may be that that mine never delivers another big stone. That might have been it. Maybe it's it for the next 50 years. You don't know. Quite frankly, until we are really working on it, we really cut the stone. Graf realized it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but also a major challenge. I knew it was going to cost a lot of money, and I didn't really know what we were going to get out of it. There's a little bit of a gamble. We don't know until way into the operation. Only once we own it can we open up the window. No one can be really sure what's going to come out of a rough diamond. We, we work along as we go along. If there's some... He bought the diamond for $12 million without knowing what the end result might be. From a rough diamond, you can never really be sure if it's going to have imperfection. You may have a good idea on the yield, but whether it's flawless, whether it's VVS, very, very slightly imperfect, is a differential in price of 40%. We play around with a very important stone, really with our heart in our hand, because something can go wrong at any time. Graf had his diamond, but he also knew that months of challenging, intricate work and risk lay ahead before the Lesotho promise could be cut up to become an exclusive collection. On the face of it, successful diamond dealer Lawrence Graf might possess most things a man might ever want, from his personal fortune to his private plane. But what he wanted more than anything else when he bought one of the world's rarest gems, called the Lesotho Promise, back in November 2006, was to turn it into a beautiful collection of unique diamonds. It was something that would take a year, 
a gamble that always had the risk that something might go wrong, even with a dedicated team of diamond craftsmen taking it through its intricate process. Work began on the gem with a small section initially polished and the interior opened up for inspection, a procedure known as cutting a window. But whether it's flawless, whether it's VVS very, very slightly imperfect, is a differential in price of 40%. Scanning devices were used to get a three-dimensional model of the interior of the $12 million gem. Cracks and flaws were duly photographed and placed on the 3D model to find an optimum way to cut the stone. A flaw in the edge of the stone, which is invisible to the naked eye, might cause a crack, drastically reducing its value. Because the rough stone is very valuable. And if we make a mistake with the yield, we're going to lose substantially on the stone. For four long months, the diamond experts analyzed the stone before even attempting to cut it into smaller stones. It's treacherous, it's polish, it can be brittle. There's grain in a stone, you've got to go the right way. And besides going the right way, you've got to get the shape and besides the shape, you've got to work to industry standards. You just can't polish it any way. So this is a plastic uh, mold of the original piece of rough. What it doesn't portray, and we couldn't do that in the mold, was the huge black interior, the fossil that was inside this diamond, and how complicated it was to work around this fossil. As the gem was prepared for cutting and polishing, Graf continued with his international role of bringing some of the world's finest gems to the people who can afford them. And one of the new emerging areas he tapped into is the burgeoning business in Russia. We set up our brand and lucky enough today we're number one in this country. Price of diamonds have increased tremendously, but it doesn't mean to say they won't increase further. In fact, they will. Um, the reason being, there's more spendable wealth out there today than I've ever known. And it's lateral. It's happening everywhere. We are right at the top of the luxury industry. Russia is one of the best markets for luxury products at this moment. And we've found that the Russian people do want quality. And when it comes to jewellery, I have to say they've been basically elegant right from the beginning. They like simplicity and the very finest stones. If you go back in history, you'll see what wealth there was in this country. Palaces full of gold and marbles and malachites and jewels. And it was quite remarkable. The wealth in Russia, the wages, is fueled by the rising energy prices and the oil and gas, which has given immense wealth to uh, quite a, a significant portion of society. Wages in Russia are increasing uh, over 20%, I think, last few years. And so this new wealth that many Russians uh, have felt has driven the demand for diamonds in, in, in Russia and the demand for these new brands. As time goes by, the Russian women are getting smarter and smarter. Now, when it comes to jewellery, I have to say they've been basically elegant right from the beginning. They like simplicity and the very finest stones. We've come a long way, always on the back of those beautiful glittering stones, those precious rare stones that we've helped through nature to not only acquire, but to develop after acquiring and turning in them into the most beautiful gems in the world. When it comes to handling diamonds, Graf knows that patience and skill always produce the best results. We have to get it right immediately. And that's why we plan so long. And that's why we hold our heart in our hands before making the first approach. Do you know how hard diamonds are? It's the hardest substance in the world to actually cut a diamond, a rough diamond. You can only cut it with another diamond. There's no other way of cutting a diamond. So when we saw 
we coat diamond dust on the saw. And to saw a stone can take weeks. It's a very slow, precise process. The large diamond was cut into several smaller, unique pieces to form a collection. But for each of the craftsmen, it's been a long and nerve-wracking process. To cut and polish a gem of this magnitude into its smaller parts takes several months of hard work and dedication. But at the end of the day, a cut and polished collection will be there, to be worn and enjoyed by those with money to spend. The only technology here is the computer. After the computer, we go back to the bench and we use the same sort of tools as we've been using for generations. The cut diamonds are measured according to the four C's, the, the value of the diamonds, the cut, carat weight, the color, and the clarity. It's the combination of the four that measure the rarity of the diamonds. Cutting up a diamond of this size is a three-dimensional strategy. The experts, many of whom have been with Graf for years, use expressions like cleaving and sawing. But there is nothing brutal in their approach as they carefully and meticulously dissect the stone into a range of beautiful pieces. People often talk about the fire of a diamond, where the facets catch the light and bring a special glow to a gem. It's here that the diamond craftsmen create that fire, cutting and polishing until they are satisfied the gem will pass muster by Graf, who is a perfectionist when it comes to precious stones. It's quite a meticulous job. You over-polish and you overdo things just for the certificate. You might polish for days a little blemish which no one would ever see, and which is often very difficult to see even under a magnifying glass. But it's there, scientifically it's got to come out to get the flawless certificate, and we have to do all little adjustments. Finally, after six months of cutting and polishing, Lawrence Graf has achieved his aim. Out of Africa came a rough diamond. Now, a sumptuous collection of 26 D flawless gems has been born. In a sense, they are Graf's children, cut and polished by his family. Some of the most fabulous jewels in the world to be enjoyed for years to come. When you finally get the collection together and you see this array of diamonds, you see the beauty and the life and the shapes. It's so exciting. This is the largest stone in the collection. 70 plus carats, getting on for 80 carats. Absolute perfection, perfect shape, wonderful life. But I know this is going to make somebody really happy when it's on a magnificent diamond chain creation, hanging from it. It's gonna make somebody very, very happy. And it's gonna make a man look, feel, and be very powerful that he acquired this stone and his lady has it around her neck. A heart shape approaching 50 carats, absolutely flawless and perfection. LP3, a brilliant cut, full of life, a ball of fire, perfectly shaped. The emerald cut, Perfectly faceted, beautiful proportions. We hit the jackpot with the sofa promise every stone is perfect. So naturally it's very profitable, but it could have gone the other way too. The value is probably several times its original cost, but no one likes to talk about something like price when such beauty is there to simply behold. It's taken a year, hundreds of man hours. And at the end of the day, Lawrence Graf has achieved what he set out to do. He also knows he may never find a gem like that again.